Uh, first of all, uh, this is the 2020 Statistical Science Lecture. Thank you very much for coming. We're doing this in a hybrid fashion. Um, you know, a little bit of battery and a little bit of... You know, uh, and so we're going to have a hybrid. Uh, you are part of the actual and the virtual will come on in just a few minutes. Um, this lecture is in the School of Mathematics and Applied Statistics and it's thanks to a philanthropic donation to the university that we're able to run this every year. Our first lecture was in 2018, um, and we are now 2020, and many happy returns. So um, I want to welcome uh, our distinguished visitors. I want to welcome uh, Associate Dean for Research, Kim Min, and also representing the head of school of SMAS, Maureen Edwards, coming. And I want to also recognise you uh, for being here and enjoying this social occasion, as well as uh, an academic occasion. I'd like to pay my respects and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay my respect to elders past, present and future. I would also like to extend my respects uh, to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, the uh, people who are present today. Um, now we're really uh, so pleased to have Sally Cripps come to talk to us. Sally is a professor, at, uh, professor extraordinaire, if they have such a title at the University of Sydney. Um, uh, and is currently um, not only professor in mathematics and statistics at the University of Sydney, but also runs an ARC training centre called DARE. Um, Sally just loves acronyms, and I love her acronyms. This one is Data Analytics for Resources Environments, um, and it's a training program. And she just told me at lunch that they re have recruited 15 PhD students to start next year. Uh, this just represents an amazing future for statistics um, in the region uh, and in general in Australia. So it's an honour to be here actually and to be speaking to you and all. It's a particular pleasure because uh, this is the first time I think I've been up in front of you know, people in 3D rather than in 2D in the last eight months. So it is lovely to see everybody and to be actually feeling that life is perhaps slowly going to come back to some new normal, probably not the old normal, but some new normal. So thank you. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about uh, Zen and the art of Bayesian geology. It just started off with the Bayesian geology, uh, but then as a result of um, running the ARC PhD training program, uh, we actually extended the sort of work that we were doing um, from geology to uh, hydrology and ecology, recognising that any decision that we make about our natural resources is, in, is dependent upon all these um, uh, issues or three things together and so to study one in isolation was maybe to miss the point and so hence the title of the talk has sort of expanded. Uh, this work that I'm going to present today represents a body of work that I've been doing over about the last two years uh, with various collaborators who I have named down the bottom there so it is not all my efforts it's, it's every bit as uh, it's actually mostly the very talented postdocs that we have working at the centre who've been working hard to do this. So I'm very pleased to be able to present uh, their work to you. Uh, so let me just, um, I'm, that's, that's, oh, I'll give you a bit of a blurb about uh, DARE. It's a ARC centre where we are trying to uh, both uh, develop new techniques in data science rather than applying existing techniques, so new techniques in data science that are inspired by and will be applied to natural resources. So about half the team is mathematical statisticians and computer scientists like myself and the other half of the team are either ecologists, hydrologists or, um, uh, or, or geologists. Um, so we're about doing, working on really tricky problems uh, in order to develop new techniques in, in essentially uh, what's now called data science, which I call mathematical statistics. Okay, so why Zen? Why do we need to be Zen? Well, there was a couple of reasons. I mean, I, I suppose I like the, the book, the Zen and the Art of um, Motorcycle Maintenance. But also because a lot of the problems I'm going to talk to you about today are incredibly tricky problems and you do need to be quite zen not to lose your cool when you try to tackle them. And also because I learnt a lot along the way. So we're going to be having lessons that I've learnt along the way in order to try and tackle um, a lot of these problems. So what is it that is so difficult about natural resources? And I, I'll just start out with a result. So here 
Um, we are trying to, one of the problems, and I'll be talking about it in detail later on, so don't worry if you can't get it all now, is we're trying to look at what might have been rainfall and the rock erodibility of a certain area in New Zealand 25 million years ago. And, and we, as you'll see, we'll be Bayesian. And this is a representation of the posterior distribution. So this is our representation of what I don't know about the rainfall and erodibility at that point in time. It is incredibly difficult to sample from a distribution or to explore or to uncover a distribution that looks like this. And we'll go on as to why actually that's, it's sort of an artifact uh, but it is a, it's so uncertainty quantification is really key in natural resources, but very, very hard to do. So that's why we need to be Zen. Okay, so just to sort of reiterate, I suppose, what is it that characterizes data and the methods that we use in natural resources? Well, firstly, we have very little data on the quantity of interest. We may have lots of sensors, uh, but not on the thing that we actually want to measure. So data is sparse and ambiguous, the systems are complex, there are extreme outcomes and often decisions made, like whether you drill or don't drill, uh, are irreversible in terms of the impact that they have. So they have long-term uh, considerations and under such conditions, quantification of uncertainty is fundamental to making good choices, to making good decisions. That's why uncertainty quantification in the natural resources is so important. And I will go, so lesson one, I've learned, so lesson one, we're going to have 10 lessons along the way. Lesson one is to be Bayesian. Uh, why? Because with all this sparse and ambiguous data, Bayesian methods offer a principled way of combining various data in a proper probabilistic sense. Uh, hierarchical models can be used to break down the complexity into layers uh, and in order to induce uh, complexity via simple things through the hierarchy. Uh, they naturally, the posterior distribution naturally gives you uncertainty quantification. So that's why I think it's important in this context, not always, to be Bayesian. Uh, before I came here uh, today, or before I gave this talk today, I was lucky enough to speak to a lot of the PhD students uh, that live in the Maths and Stats School. Uh, and they seem to be working on similar problems, and problems which I would call inversion problems. What do I mean by inversion problems? I mean that there are many, potentially infinite amount of explanations uh, that give rise to what I see. So, so many possible explanations for how I arrived at that data. That's the inversion problem. As such, constraining the model space is key. Uh, and in order to constrain the model space, we need to actually combine all the pieces of information that we have in order to, to do that, to, to do the constraining. So that's information from data uh, and physical models because a lot of, there are a lot of physical models in natural resources that actually in, um, encode a lot of information but not via data. Uh, information from um, expert opinion and previous research. And so that's why uh, Bayesian reasoning is very helpful because it does all that. Um, they have very difficult posterior, so we, if we're going to be Bayesian, we're going to be measuring uncertainty via the posterior distribution. The posteriors are very difficult to explore, mainly because of a lot of constraints, and so recent developments in, in how we would normally explore such posteriors, such as Hamiltonian, Monte Carlo, so HMC, they require gradients, they don't work, because there are often no gradients that exist. So, so exploring these spaces is very tricky mathematically uh, as well. So today, <laughs> we're going to be talking about three examples, and the first example is to try and understand what's up to five kilometres below the Earth's crust in the Cooper Basin. And the reason we want to know that is because there are granite intrusions, and if we can find granite intrusions, we can use them for thermal energy. So that's the first problem that we're going to be looking at. The second problem is, what can we learn about landform changes from what the climate may have been like in the past? Learning about how climate vary back 25 million years can help us get a future or get a better handle on what climates may be in the future. So that's the second problem. Can we learn from landforms and the way that a landforms evolve? Does that tell us something about the rainfall that was present in the past. The third problem is how do coral reefs form and what are the processes which affect them? 
and again going back in some sense in deep time as far as coral reefs are concerned, going back um, up to a million years. So, so that's, that's the first, um, they are the problems that I'm going to be uh, looking at. And I just want to emphasise here that although we have so many sensors sensing everything, we have very little information of any, on any of these things. There's hardly any information about what lives five kilometres below the Earth's crust because uh, putting a drill hole down is incredibly expensive, right? So, so we rely on, on measurements at the surface, but they're not measuring what we actually want to measure, which is what's down there. They tell us something. We've got to infer what's five kilometres below, uh, but we don't actually have measurements on what's five kilometres below. Equally, we do not have measurements about what the rainfall was doing 25 million years ago. Despite the best data collection now, we simply don't. So we've got to infer something that we have data now on something that we didn't know in the past at all. We have no measurements on that. We have no measurements, if you think about it. Prediction in any context is as, you know, an area that we haven't seen before. And so all of that are sparse data in the sense we have very little observations on the quantity of interest. And the same goes with oral, uh, coral reefs. And so this gives rise to lesson number two. Big data is not the solution to the universe's problems at all. So we can have all, there's a rush to put sensors in and a rush to be collecting data. The question is what data is relevant? How am I going to use it to ask a, uh, answer a question? How am I going to build it all together so that I'm fairly confident that any decisions I make as a result of that data are robust? That's what I actually want to do. So I've talked about these problems having um, uh, many com uh, pr uh, characteristics uh, in common, these problems. Uh, one of the characteristics, and I'm going to go through these later, are that they often have a lot of um, physics behind them, so a lot of information contained in those equations, which is not data, but which I want to somehow incorporate into my model uh, to, to learn about what the process is. So uh, that first one is just a forward model that says if I have and there I've got, um, uh, you know, rho is density. This is, a, this is the gravitational concept. This is R cubed. This is something, this is called a forward model. It's probably the simplest forward model I can think of that actually if I know a size of a sphere underground and I know the um, uh, density of that sphere, I can calculate what I think the gravi gravity should be at the surface, right? So that's a for what, what I would call a forward model and that's a forward model for gravity. This, these are forward models. Uh, Z here is the height of the, um, is, is the elevation, uh, and here is a, a qu an equation that tells me how uh, the elevation is going to change in response to essentially three pieces of forces. One is the tectonic uplift, the other one is uh, hillside processes, and the other one is river processes. So, so how do how do landforms change as uh, tectonic plates move, and yet they get eroded at the same time? Um, by, by rainfall, by rivers, and by other hillside processes. The last one is about coral reefs. Um, and we've got many different types of corral jewel assemblages that could exist on a coral reef. And this is just telling me something about how that process changes over time. And the interest here centers on this, uh, this, this alpha coefficient here, which tells me um, how much competition one coral type of coral gel assembly each has over another. So we're in a situation where we've got ambiguous data, decisions with long-term consequences, uncertain futures, and heterogeneous stakeholders. So that means that people want different things, and we need to be able to make decisions. And so what could possibly go wrong? Well, as you'll see, quite a lot went wrong as we were trying to attack these problems. So, Let's get down to the first one, which is geology. So the first thing, so lesson number three, I learned, which has been fascinating learning about all these different things, but ge geophysicists are not geologists and they get very offended. They're in fact almost entirely different species. Uh, and let me, and this is important for, for me because it's actually framed the way we should think about these problems, trying to understand how you get the best from both because they really don't speak to each other. So geophysicists, they're interested in getting a really flexible estimate of some of the subsurface properties of what is, you know, obviously underground. So they may be looking at what the magnetic map is of underground. They may be looking at um, density or various other bits and pieces and they're trying to get a really flexible estimate of what happens underground and they produce really nice 
pictures. And this is, for example, Willuna is a place in Western Australia. This is a, a gravity map and a magnetics map of what geophysicists would had to produce for the base layer of Willuna. Now, what geologists do is they come along and they draw squiggly lines over all this because they're interested in the interpretation of it. They're interested is, well, what does that say about faults? What does that say about the location of minerals? What does that say about the way plates have moved over time? So they have a very different take on it, but in some ways, as I've said here, geological maps are themselves a model. They're not data. They're a model of what a geologist thinks. And so the challenge, I think, in figuring out what lies under our surface is, um, in, as I've said, they're integrated workflows that take into account both the information we get from geophysicists and the information what we get from geologists to give us something meaningful to make inference over what's happening underneath. So a geophysics particular sort of prototype problem is you've got sensor data, so you measure things on the surface. You've got things like gravity, uh, magnetic telluric, seismic data, all sorts of stuff. You also may have very few uh, boreholes, so you'll actually have some pieces of information that tell you what sort of rock lives at a certain level, but hardly any. And you've got geological expert knowledge, those maps of what geologists think are down there. And some way, I've got to combine them in order to make a best decision about how we're going to use Australia's resources. So, so that's the sort of pro problem set up. And if we just, I just didn't know what the audience is, is experience was with things like Bayesian techniques, so I thought I'd just give a quick sort of example of how fusing different sorts of information leads to better understanding. This is a map, or this is a graph of along here is depth, where our problem here is how far to the basement. So the basement is uh, under the lithosphere, so that's where things get really hard, right? So, and, and, and things that geologists are interested in, um, they need to know those sorts of prop, um, properties. So, so this is depth to basement here, and this is the posterior distribution of depth to basement. This vertical line here represents the truth. This is a synthetic example and we want to know how deep is the depth to basement. And what we have available to us is a magnetic telluric um, sensors, that's the red line, uh, and also gravity sensors, that's the green line. So if we were to use only magnetic tellurics data, uh, we would think that the, you know, the, here is the posterior distribution based only on magnetic tellurics, and we would say, well, the depth to basement is most likely to be about you know, about four kilometres and not 10 kilometres, right? Um, when we look at the green line, we, we would say it was about here, about nine kilometres, so that's a better guess, but the blue line combines them both, and you can see we get a much better estimate of the depth to basement when we combine both of those pieces of information, as you would expect, into understanding how far down the bedrock is. The idea is to actually incorporate what those geology maps are as a prior distribution, right? So take what the geologists think with their drawings as a prior. And then we, in our likelihood, our data is going to be what we sense at the surface. And so we're going to encode the geophysics of the problem in this likelihood function via forward models to give us our posterior, okay? And theta here, uh, as usual, is the unknown. That's what we want to make inference over. And in this particular case, it's what what does the subsurface structure look like in all its complexity, right? So that's what we want to find out. So how do we go about doing this? How do we actually take measurements on the surface only to find out what lives underneath? And, and also, how do we put uncertainties attached to that? So what we're going to do here is we, well, we, we hypothesise something. We might take the, those maps of the geologists and we might start up with a hypothesis. This is what we think it looks like. And this was, this is based in the Cooper Basin. So this is a what's called a layer cake uh, representation of the way rocks are formed. And, and these bits here are the granite intrusions. And maybe this is what the geologists think it looks like. So we will propose a world, right? And then what we do is say, well, if that world were real, if I was right, what would I see on the surface in terms of the gravity and the magnetic data? If, if this were true, 
would I see what I expect to see on the surface, right? Uh, and in order to do that calculation, and here was problem one, what they do is to compute what you would expect to see on the surface, they voxelize this space into cubes, right? So they take little cubes because they're trying to figure out, for example, what that forward model for, for, for density and, uh, you know, would do to gravity on the surface. So they're using forward models to say what they would expect to see. And to do that, they need to discretize a continuous space, right? So that's, and then we look at it and we say, well, look, does the actual data that we have match what I think should be there um, based on this guess of what the world looks like? Uh, and we do it as part of an MCMC scheme, as it says there, with a metropolis ratio, and we accept or reject that with the usual probabilities. So, you know, we th when we hopped into this, we thought, well, this, how hard can this be? So all we have to do is turn the MCMC handle, that's Markov Chain Monte Carlo, propose values of theta, accept or reject via metropolis step, and you'll have your answer. Easy. But actually, we were, we were so wrong. Uh, because, as I've said here, here be dragons. So if your surface that you're trying to maximise looks like this, then it's easy, right? It's nice and smooth. We've got gradients. We can take moves that will get us to that top very quickly and to understand it very quickly. So if it were like that, that would be the problem uh, solved. But unfortunately, there's uh, real data uh, rather than uh, toy data. And these are the sort of distributions that we're actually having to explore uh, rather than these nice smooth things. So what these distributions both show is lots of discontinuities. So normally if you were to maximise, you might do something like gradient descent or something like that and you'd have derivatives and you'd take them and you'd get to this, you'd, you'd be able to explore that surface very, very straightforward fashion. But here we've got a surface that actually defies almost any um, e exploration by any sampling scheme we had ever come up with. And so it actually led to a lot of new sampling schemes. Uh, we struggled with this. So, so this, this problem here, this, this posterior distribution, the first problem we, told, we tried was, okay, so how hard can it be? You know, we've got this model, or they've got this model, the people at the University of Sydney, there was Dietmar Muller in his group, and it was called Badlands, and it was a forward model about how landscapes have evolved. So we, we changed the name, we called it Baselands, and we said, you know, let's put our probabilities on what that original landform looked like um, based on all this. And so this was a really tricky problem, but we thought it would be really easy, and this is where we started. And we, we spent a lot of time getting absolutely nowhere. So, um, so the ne next lesson I learned along the way was you should start with the most simple problem that you can possibly think of. Um, and that was something that we should have done a long time ago. And it was only like eight months ago that I finally said, let's just start with a box. Our world is a box and we've got a sphere. And we, all we want to know is what the density of that sphere is and what the radius is. That seemed to be a tractable problem that should be trivial to solve. So um, that's where we finally got to. To do this, what we did was we said, okay, so let's generate some data because that way we know what the answer is. We know if we're going to get it. So we're going to generate some data. We're going to assume that it's got a radius of r and it's got a density of rho. Uh, and we're going to take our forward model for, for turning density into gravity and say, this is what I would expect to see at the surface with some measurement error. And that was what our basic, basic model would be. This is what we found. So if you look along here, this is the cross section of the true density of the rock, right? And these positions, this one is a course, this was where, where that voxelization, that cutting it up into cubes, so taking a continuous space and cutting it up into cubes, this was what we called a coarse grid. This is what we called a fine grid, and this is what's called an anti-alias grid, which is Similar to the, it's exactly the same grid size as the coarse grid, except instead of taking the centroid, 
value of that cost grid, we take an average across the grid. So we smooth it in some sense. Now, these are the theoretical gravity the, um, field that you should see at the surface. So it doesn't matter whether we did this one or this one or this one, this is what we should see at the surface. This bottom line is the posterior distribution. This is the posterior distribution of density versus the sphere's radius. What we should see is something that looks like this. The red dotted line is the truth, right? So that's what we should see. And instead, we saw these local squares, these local modes. And what was happening was that the MCMC scheme was bouncing around into one of these things and would never move out of it. And we had no idea that they were even there. We thought it was such a trivial problem and it turned out to be very difficult. So that was the first error, this idea that you can take something continuous and discretize it without introducing uncertainty into the process. So that was the first thing that we realised. But we came up with a solution which was the anti-aliasing solution. Uh, and now we're back to go back to that original problem and redo it all again. But there's more than just going on with discretization of continuous surfaces. The problem is that you're often in very high dimensional spaces. So when, if you're a geophysicist and you want some non-parametric estimate of what the subsurface structure looks like, it's typically, you know, so if you put a GP over things, a Gaussian process prior over them, then that's an infinite dimensional surface, so you're getting very, very high dimensions. And remember that most of these surfaces that we're exploring are discontinuous, right? So we cannot use anything like HMC or like uh, um, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or anything that relies on gradient knowledge. So we had to resort to uh, sampling from uh, proposals that don't require gradient knowledge. Simple things like a random walk proposal, right? So we, so we started to do that. So this is, this is a simple random walk where I say, my best guess of the next state is where I currently am, plus a bit of noise. Uh, and you can see it does quite well. This is like a random walk proposal, uh, independent random walk proposal, except it takes into account that the things the space is high dimensional and so that the various dimensions may be correlated and so I need to have a proposal that respects that structure in my uh, parameters. That's called a, uh, a anseotropic random walk. And this last one is a combination, it's called a, a preconditioned Crank-Nicholson random walk and it's a combination between actually on the one hand, if this, it's parameterized by this thing here, rho, if rho, as you can see, is uh, zero, then what this move does is say, stay exactly where you are. And if rho is one, then you're drawing from the prior. And so this is a tuning parameter, and it actually turns out to work incredibly well. Um, but as you can see, for two dimensions, all of those things are working equally well. Uh, it's a different story when we go up to 100 dimensions. For 100 dimensions, the simple random walk doesn't move at all. Uh, the um, anseotropic random walk uh, gets there, but it's very correlated, it's not great, whereas the preconditioned Trank Nisselton works brilliantly. Uh, so that was also took a bit of exploring, and as we'll come to it, the future areas of research, what we're now currently doing is de developing new techniques uh, that can actually have the um, speed of a, something like a Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, but at the same time not require gradients. And lastly, these surfaces have a lot of local structure. So they can have different characteristics in different parts of the distribution and you need um, proposals that can cope with this local structure, which typically most of the techniques don't do all that well. Uh, and our solution to the local structure, well, it's probably a lot of people's solution is this idea of having parallel Markov chains, so uh, which are blown up at different temperatures. So the idea of uh, Parallel tempering, for example, here, I've got, say this is my true posterior distribution that I'm trying to sample from. If I sort of stretch it out a bit, smear it a bit, I get this sort of distribution. If I smear it again, I get this sort of a distribution until such times as it's totally flat. Now, the advantage of smearing is that I can move from this mode to this mode relatively easy. Right? 
much more easily than I can jump from this mode to this one. So I'm being able to move through those um, various uh, modes in chains that are high temperature or low temperature chains so that I can actually explore the entire space. Now, then what I do is I then swap iterates between the chains. So I use the parallel chains um, to, to swap the iterates from various schemes into the final iterate, into the final chain down here, so that this becomes the realisation of my scheme and I'm able to explore local structure. Right, so we had to end up by doing this parallel tempering in conjunction with um, uh, within chain moves that, that didn't need uh, gradient information. So that was number three. Uh, and this is just showing how the different proposals can, can uh, cover or not recover the space. So this is um, showing, for example, this PCN is this preconditioned crank Nicholson. And you can show this was a structure that had lo local modes. Uh, and you can see that this is about the only one that actually gets a good handle on the fact that that's a multimodal distribution that I wanted to explore. So this, is, um, this was encouraging. However, we're still a long way to go. Um, this is our assessment of the probability of granite at the fifth level in that layer cake representation that I showed you. So we're, we're still talking about the Cooper Basin and being underneath it. And you can see that this is one uh, realisation from an MCMC run of the probability of being uh, locating granite, and this is another realisation of the same, the probability of being in, uh, finding granite at level five too, just different starting points. So we're, we, we are still yet to properly be able to converge on this, and this is le the uh, similar graphs for level six. And then we thought, well, it's working well enough now, we can use it in other locations. So we decided that we would take it from the Cooper Basin out to uh, the Gascoigne, which is a place in Western Australia, and then we worked with a whole bunch of um, geologists and I was amazed to know that actually the data comes from people ra walking around and saying, oh, this rock looks like that piece of big formation over there, so I'm going to call it this. And that's literally what happens. So they go into the field, they collect a rock and they say, oh, I reckon it's like that one there, so I'm going to give them the same label, which is better than nothing. But that dead lesson number five, people make mistakes and you need to be able to um, uh, account for that in any sort of uh, data processing or sampling scheme that you're going to come up with. So um, this is what we did. We, we assumed that they had the correct classification. We put a distribution over that. We said it was a binomial distribution, the number of the classifications that I get right, and everybody was allowed. So, so this was allowing for the data to be wrongly classified because misclassified data is another big problem in natural resources. So finally, finally, we were able to produce this, which we're fairly confident represents the posterior mean of the mineral, a particular type of mineral, mineralogy in the Gascoigne region in Western Australia. I want to um, explain why the uh, quantification of uncertainty is just so important, um, and not just because I have to make, uh, well, it is because of the decisions I make, but one of the most important, or one of the first decisions I will ever make is what is it that I need to do next? What piece of information do I need to get? If I'm uncertain about what it looks like, where should I take my next sample from? How should I sample well is a big question. So here what we've got, this is what I would call deterministic inversion. There's red, it says that, okay, so granite is here with probability one and here with probability one, but here with probability zero. Uh, this is obviously probabilistic, inversion, uh, the darker colours represent the higher probability that granite is there. And this is what we think about when we want to actually figure out uh, where we, so if this is our truth and we want to understand it more, we want to say, where should I take the next point? And if we want to reduce our, if our goal is to reduce our uncertainty the most, uh, then we would want to take that point uh, that was about where the probability was about 0.5 because that means we really don't have any idea, right? So we would want to take a data point here. That led to a whole bunch of research on what does it mean, what principles can we bring to bear 
on this decision process of how to sequentially acquire information to reduce my uncertainty the most. So how are we going to do that well? Well, what we really want to do, I suppose mathematically, is to say the location at which we take the next sample is going to be the argmax, or so it will be that location which maximises my expected utility, however I choose to define that utility, right? So the utility could be defined as a reduction in uncertainty, so I'm really averse to uncertainty, so that could be my utility. My utility could be uh, I want the probability of um, hitting granite, which is a different utility from reduction of uncertainty. So if you work for Geoscience Australia, you're probably more interested in a utility function which says reduce my uncertainty. If you work for Newcrest, you're probably more interested in a utility function that says I want to maximise the probability that I'm going to hit or going to discover minerals I want to discover. But in any case, whatever that utility is, the principle is the same, which is I want a sample where that will satisfy um, this condition, which is that I maximise my expected utility, where the expectation of the utility is taken with respect to the predictive distribution of what I will find, okay? So the predictive distribution of the date, given the data. So that's what we want to do. We're going to call here Bayesian optimization, and so we want to choose the next sampling location by maximising um, and here I'm going to slip into uh, the language of one of my postdocs, actually a guy called Roman Marchant, who, who helped me put this together. Uh, what they do in robotics is they make these decisions about where to acquire information all the time, and they replace the word utility function for an acquisition function. But they are the, effectively the same thing, right? So I want to take the next location, I want to sample from the next location uh, to maximise some acquisition function, whatever, however I design that, define that acquisition function. So how does this work? Well, let's imagine we've got two data points, right? So we've got two data points here and here. This is the function, this dotted line is the true function. And our estimate of it, based on those two points, is this black line. Here, this is my acquisition function, H, and it's this green line here. In this particular case, it was a, a combination of wanting to hit the maximum, but at the same time wanting to reduce my uncertainty. So we took a combination of both things. We want to do both, and we, we're free to choose what that trade-off is. Um, and so here is my acquisition function. So this would say, for example, that the next point I should sample should be here because this is where my acquisition function is highest. So I do that, I get that observation, I get a new acquisition function, uh, and I maximise that, and so on and so forth. So this is the way that I think about sequentially sampling into the future as I'm getting more and more information, and it's a much smarter way than just deciding you're going to drill um, holes at a grid across Australia, if you want to find out you know, what lies underneath, we can actually be very smart about how to do it in a really sensible fashion. And so the next slide is an example of this in action in a real case. Uh, and this was um, uh, about the, the, the groundwater in Adelaide. Those blue dots that you can see here, they are wells, they are active wells. The red dots are ones that I'd have no information on, right? So they're, they're inactive. The colours on this map actually represent the uncertainty, right? So this is the stand, this, these uh, red bits means I have no idea and that makes sense because they're very far away from any information. And the blue bits means, you know, I have lots of information and that makes sense when I can see them here. Uh, because they're uh, sited around where uh, wells are. But do we really need all those wells in order to be able to understand what the groundwater is doing in Adelaide? Do I need all of those? What, what you're going to see now is an animation of how we sequentially move, remove each well, where the first well that we're going to remove represents the minimum information. It, 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 has, it makes no sense to have that well and, and another well. So, so for example, 
the first wells that are actually going to get removed, you, there's two here, I don't know if you can see that. That one is going to go and I think this one goes too. Anyway, what, what you see here is an animation of how we actually remove those wells and then it goes into a mean function but I think I might skip that. But, but just so you can see that actually we can remove quite a few without actually substantially changing what we know. So this is, it's just a reduction and it's going to go through it all the way. Obviously when we remove everything, we get, and now it's coming back the other way. So you can see the amount of, it's now going to go into the mean function, but I think I might skip that. But that's an example of Bayesian optimization working to try and understand what lies in the groundwater with a minimum amount of wells, uh, which is often the problem also in geology. All right, so just quickly going through these last two examples. Um, the, as I said, the, this is actually where we started uh, all the work with what's called Badlands. Um, this is Dietmar Muller's group at the University of Sydney and we came along and as I said earlier, we called it Baselands and we really just wanted to understand what the climate was looking like in New Zealand at a particular, past in the, a particular point in the past. So, and how we could infer it from uh, landscapes uh, that we observe now. So they have a, um, a model that tells us how uh, landscapes change over time. Uh, you've got three processes going on, as I mentioned, tectonic plate movements, diffusive process move movements, and water flow and the associated erosion. And these, are, these represent, they're analogous to that uh, gravity forward model. These represent a forward model. They say, if I knew what I started with and I roll the, the, the model forward, this is what I would expect to see at the surface. And so we looked at three particular examples. This was the initial, these are, um, the last one is not, you know, um, simulated, but the first two are. So these were an example of a crater that eroded over time, of a uplift that happened with mountains, and this is a continental, uh, a continental margin or continental shelf in uh, New Zealand. So this, this work has uh, just was published late last year. Uh, we have a model for uh, how we relate our observations to what the expected elevation would look like conditional on all those um, factors. And here we are trying to understand or recover from this crater model what the distribution of rainfall was. Uh, this is the um, precipitation, I think, if I haven't got my glasses on. Uh, uh, back in, in the past. And so this first top line is, is for when we only were doing this initially and we only had a single MCMC chain. This is when we hadn't figured out what was really going on. And this bottom line is when we figured out that we really should be running parallel Markov chains to try and understand that particular problem. And you can see that we get a very, very good estimate, well, a much better, I won't know if I say very good, but it's certainly a much better estimate than we got with a single chain. However, when we tried this on the continental margin, you know, the single chain is certainly nowhere near converging. The parallel chains themselves simply, the only reason that we're getting any movement or any distribution at all is because we're swapping between chains because the within chain moves are just stationary. They are not moving at all. Uh, so this led to a realisation, another learning, was that sometimes you do have to admit defeat, uh, but only temporarily, because we're working on that problem now, uh, and that hopefully will um, uh, be resolved sometime in the next year. So how to come up with sampling schemes that efficiently explore that parameter space. These are the results of that, uh, and you can see here that, that this we can extrapolate. We have a very, this was the, the uh, simulated example. So you can see here, this was the end result, and we managed to extrapolate back uh, pretty close to what was, which was flat before. Uh, and here is the real one, and this is what we think it actually looked like um, uh, 25 million years ago. Uh, 
This is a cross-section through all those with the, with the associated uncertainties. Uh, and again, you can see that we do the simulated examples very well. Uh, we do the continental margin not too bad, except we, we, we struggle. We're very, we struggle with trying to pinpoint where that sudden drop is in the continental margin. And these were our posterior distributions that look so ugly. And as I said, now we're going to go back and redo them now with the anti alias and hopefully we might even get something sensible. Okay, so the last example is a forward model on uh, Bayes, we called it, it was Pi Reef. You know, we're not all that original uh, most of the time, now with our acronym. This one we just called Bayes Reef. You know, there was Bayes Lands and now there's Bayes Reef. Um, anyway, so we are trying to recover what the, the order of events, how was this uh, corral jewel assemblage, how was it laid down over time? It's an incredibly tricky problem. Um, it involves so many different variables, uh, but we did end up getting quite good results. It, um, what, you can, what we're trying to recover is this, and this is what we do actually recover, so we're doing not a bad job on what we're actually trying to recover. But I do want to go on to say, how we, where, what are the future directions? Well, we really need to start to scale it up to induce a lot more complexity in the models that we're considering. Um, most geological formations are not layer cakes, they're rich with faults. And so, we, so we're starting to work on um, different parts of Australia that, that represent trickier geologies to uncover. That's the first one. The second one is trying to somehow move around that hideous looking space or that distribution in some meaningful fashion. We're, so we're doing, uh, there was a, some work uh, in 2015 on kernelised Hamiltonian Monte Carlo where you use surrogate models effectively. They do get away from you having to write down explicitly what the gradients are in order to get to move around the space but they do assume that the gradients exist, it's just that you can't calculate them. So again, that's not our world. Our world is where the gradients themselves are, simply don't exist. So this has led to a new piece of work that we're doing, which is we call non-volume preserving nuts, the non-volume preserving no U-turn sampler. There is a new turn, no U-turn sampler. Those of you who do MCMC will know all about nuts. Um, so basically what we're working on is how to do this um, HMC when you cross boundaries that are uh, uh, discontinuous. And that's some really promising work that we've just submitted um, literally last week or the week before. Right. So just to sum up and wrap up, I, I want to sort of put it in a bigger picture, which is really what we're trying to do with all of this is trying to make good decisions, uh, for example, in natural resources, about how we're going to steward Australia's natural resources going into the future. There is, you know, typically we're thinking about we've got data, we're using that to form models, to discover what's underneath and then making decisions. But at each one of these points, there is so much uncertainty. There's uncertainty with observations in missing values, sampling bias, measurement error. Uh, the physical models, they're just physical models. They're not truth either, and they may be the wrong physical model that is being used. So how do we, how do we um, you have, deal with model mismatch? How do we deal with going from continuous down to finite representations? Expert opinion is really key in all of this uh, because there is simply not enough data to do any sort of uh, sort of superficial data science, you know, deep learning algorithm on this. Uh, deep learning would do terribly on these models, right? So, because it's very sparse data and it's noisy and it's, it simply won't work. Uh, then we've got the uncertainty associated in, you know, have we proposed the right uh, data generating process from a stats point of view, from a probabilistic point of view. You know, there's a so, many, so much error in um, when we try to estimate those posteriors. There is, um, then the decisions I make, and probably the hardest decisions, uh, are the ones that are, I simply, you know, I've got many competing stakeholders. How do I figure out 
How do I trade off one criteria against another? These are all really important questions, I think, that we need to study. And so, you know, this is just a quote from Hamlet. You know, he says, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than I've dreamt of in your philosophy. And I've just changed it. There is more uncertainty. That's what I've learned. There are more uncertainties in heaven and earth than actually I thought of. So that's lesson seven. Lesson eight is work with the domain specialist. There is no way that data science is magically going to reveal these um, solutions to these incredibly complex problems. We need to be working, we being statisticians, machine learners, whatever you want to call yourself, uh, we need to be working with people who are experts and have deep knowledge of the area in this field. Lesson number nine is we must be absolutely transparent about what we know and what we don't know. We must, if we don't do this, the public will lose trust and it would be a shame because I think that data science and statistics has got an awful lot to contribute to our understanding of natural resources. But if we don't accurately and honestly report uncertainties, we will lose the public's trust in at the results or the endeavours in statistical modelling, machine learning, whatever you want to call it. And lastly, I want to say that actually, I mean, I'm going to wrap up here. So, but, it's fun, right? So I, I really feel that I've got to learn so much by being a statistician, and, and this is a quote from a famous statistician, the best thing about being a statistician is that you get to play in everybody's backyard. So what does it take to be Zen? Well, be Bayesian. Think useful data, not big data. They're not all the same. We're inclined in statistics to think there are mathematicians or statisticians in the rest of the universe. That may be true, but the rest of the universe has also got a lot of variability. Start with something simple. I cannot emphasize that enough. There are always errors and make sure in the data, so we need to build in the methods of detecting those errors. There will always be problems you can't solve. There are many sources of uncertainty. No one discipline has the solution to any of these problems. We need to form multidisciplinary teams. Be honest and transparent about what you know and what you don't know, and have fun. Thank you. I just want to say, uh, well, I think we'll close the webinar now, and um, we'll give a, a real a round of applause, and I'll let you guys online give your virtual round of applause. Thank you. We're now into the stats science lecture part of the talk, and the floor is now open to questions. Um. Sally, that was, that was great. Um, one of the things you didn't really go into any great detail about, and I was curious about the impact on your uncertainty, was the provenance of the data you used to formulate it, how the data were collected. Uh, that is very often just ignored in a lot of these things. The data are given, and nobody worries about who got them, how they got them. You didn't very come a little bit to it when you are talking about the geologists and how they label those stones. And, and, and so I thought, I just wonder if you want to say a few words about problems. Yes, okay. it's an excellent, excellent question. And it's a huge issue. Um, and, and if I left it out, it was because I honestly didn't, I think it would be a talk in and of itself, rather than as something put into uh, a, a talk. And that's, um, uh, it's, it's uh, so, you know, absolutely, the data matters, how it was collected, why it was collected. Um, also, it's often common in, in these natural resources to, to treat models as data. So they've got m simulations coming out from mathematical models which they treat as data. Um, there, I was alarmed to find out that when we started looking at doing deep learning for vegetation mapping across Australia, that actually they only had one actual data point in all of South Australia. And yet they gave out data on a grid of, you know, of quite a, like a grid of three kilometres. So, so, and that was, but that was given as actual data. They obviously probably did something fairly reasonable. They probably smoothed it with some sort of GP or something, which, but ignoring the uncertainty that's associated with all that is, is huge. And actually, one of the first things that we decided to do, or first projects for the DARE thing was, to actually at, just look at the data and try and figure out how uncertain we are about the data. And also, I think this comes to another point that I, I want to emphasise is that we shouldn't confine ourselves to what's already existing. I think now, we, you know, a lot of this data that we have was not collected for the reasons that we now want to use it for.
And um, so now what we need to do is figure out, you know, you always start with the problem. What question is it that I want to know? And what data do I need to answer that question? And by and large, I think that there'll be some data that is useful, but most of it won't be. So we need to go out and we need to think smartly about how we collect data to answer a particular problem. And I think that for some reason, we're still a long way from that thinking. I was having lunch and, and, and talking to David and everything, and, and, the, um, and it came out, you know, that you know, what are we doing with COVID, for example? We, we could have been collecting data and getting people tested who were both healthy and not healthy to really understand how COVID was spreading. And yet, and yet we're still doing this, you know, biased sampling by people who were sick. So we're a long way, I think, from thinking like that, but that's where we need to go. So thank you. So okay, coming up with the posterior distribution is, is the first thing, and then we need to make a decision based yeah. on some utility function. Um, uh, well, one thing that concerns me is that could be defined as utility function wrong, you would have made a wrong decision. Absolutely. Your posterior yeah. distribution is correct. So uh, you touched a bit on utility function. I was wondering whether you could expand a bit on how you constructed those Oh, look, honestly, that's a... Okay, so the question is, I've talked about, I've talked mainly about that discovery part in the cycle, and I was asked a question about the data part, which was a good one, and now you've asked a question about the decision part, and in particular, the role of utility functions. And there are, so we have not, so that's an area of uncertainty, I mean, because... It's, it's a choice, but yet it represents variability in decisions. It will represent. And so what that utility function is will change that a lot. And that's what I mean. Decisions need to be tested against how robust they are to those utility functions. Constructing the utility function is very difficult because my utility may be different from your utility. And how do you combine, you know, all Australians own our natural resources. How do you make trade-offs between what one set of stakeholders wants versus another? And that's a whole realm of work for something like a centre of excellence to try and figure out how all those bits in that uncertainty piece, in, in that cycle, actually lead into change decisions and how can we try and make decisions robust to those choices. So there, those uncertainty, the utility functions that we were using in those slides was simply a trade-off between um, wanting to maximise the posterior and minimising the variance where we chose what that trade-off between those two things were. That's only one of many. I mean, if you think about it, what sort of way do we make decisions when we've got absolutely no data? So if you think, and I go back to COVID, you know, you think that day that they, you know, we've got this disease and we've never, we don't know anything about it. Uh, and, and in that situation, Probably probability theory doesn't add an awful lot to you, to help you, you know, if you're starting way back in February. And you, you make decisions on bounded outcomes. So you might say, I do not want to end up with 50 million dead, and I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that doesn't happen, right? But then we need to understand that our, our those utilities will change as I learn more, and so we, we update those utilities. But yes, the impact of utilities on that decision process is another huge area itself, yeah. You had a very nice example where you talk about acquisition function. Yep. And I really am And I just wonder if you actually yet had a chance to work with any like yes. financial companies yes. that are actually going out and doing exploration and actually helping them and saying that, as you say, don't just do the, do the grid everywhere. Yes, we are, and that's part of um, the, 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 the training centre is one of the projects is exactly that. And that's for one of the mining companies. Um, it, they, that's probably the most valuable thing to them in everything that we do. Not so much about how to uh, optimise their operations in their mind, but actually getting them to think about how they spit, you know, each borehole can cost 10 to $100 million. So, you know, how do you, you want to do as few of those as possible, both for the economic cost and the cost to the environment. And how do you think about See that, that sequentially sampling, yes, it's a very, yes. And, and mining companies are now looking at people who are doing this too. We have a stat, uh, statistical science lecture website. It's been populated by the first one in 2018, last year in 2019, and now this year in 2020 from Sally. Uh, I'd like to join 
would, I'd like you to join with me and sincerely and enthusiastically express our appreciation for a great seminar webinar. Thank you very much, Sally. Thank you.